Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Michael Jarvis of Auxiliary Manufacturing. I met Michael and his wife and admired his work at Blade Show 2022, where his table presentation was welcoming and his knives immaculate and purpose built. The fixed blades on offer ranged from culinary to EDC and self-defense knives, all of the same level of beauty and detail. I was especially moved by the company's pocket dagger and a scalpel-like pickhall knife, because, you know, that's just my interest. Auxiliary manufacturing even makes an NPE. Uh, that's a knife for, uh, it's a it's a dagger made of G10 for carry in non-permissive environments. That's something I've talked a lot about here. So it's cool to see a company making a legit one. Uh, and one of Michael's knife models was recently awarded an esteemed international recognition. Uh, well earned, no doubt. We'll find out about that and about auxiliary manufacturing in a moment. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. Then if you wish, you can help support the show by going to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code uh, to the right of my face. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's it's my pleasure. I want to congratulate you, sir, on uh, winning Best Tactical Knife at Blade Show West, Best Custom Tactical Knife at Blade Show West this year, 2022. Tell me about that. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, it was an honor uh, for sure, you know, uh, and there's kind of a really funny story about it. You know, I, I haven't really told it many times, but so whether you know this or not, um, at these shows, you have to go and take your knife into submission. They're not just choosing, you know, a random knife from what's submitted. You have to physically take your knife up for judgment, um, which is kind of imposing on its own. I feel like a lot of people don't do it just because of that. Uh, but upon going to pick up my knife from judgment at the end of day one, uh, the guy who had them, I forget his name off the top of my head, maybe Steve, uh, looked over at his buddy and he was like, Hey, does this guy need to be at the award ceremony? And he was like, Oh no, he doesn't need to be there. And I was like, Oh, whatever. I'll go and drink free beer. Anyways. Uh, lo and behold, they called my name. I was like, Oh, it's so weird. I've never met another Michael Jarvis. This will be so exciting. And my wife's like, <laughs> talking about you go. And it's very surprising to say the least. What, so what, what's the judging like you walk up to it and they, they examine your so, knife in front of you? They don't actually judge it in front of you. You take your knife and submit it for judgment. Say maybe, you know, you have from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. to do that. And then they close the doors for maybe an hour or two while they make their choices. You know, the panel. I don't even know who it really consists of, to be honest with you. Um, and then they announce it later at whatever the award ceremony is. You know, at uh, in Atlanta, it's in the pit, of course. And so at... Salt Lake City, it was at the Black Rifle Coffee Compound. Oh, cool. Oh, that sounds yeah, it was awesome. a pretty cool party they threw. Man, knives and coffee, like two of my favorite things. And black rifles aren't aren't too far behind. Uh that's that sounds like a good time. <laughs> um, but so when you're when you're bringing your up uh, your knife up to this is so this is a a this is something I learned at my first blade show two years ago. I just sort of presumed that there were judges trolling the whole place and like, oh, that's exceptional and that but it's not like that you 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 put yourself up in the competition and then they judge uh from there and uh but do you enter into did you enter that into best for best tactical knife or did you just say here uh, here's my knife what do you think okay so they do have it broken down into uh 
you can enter three knives into three different categories. And they have factory categories um, and custom categories. Uh, among them, you know, culinary, which uh, m I'm proud of my chef knives, and they are not even close to the caliber of the knives that get entered into the culinary field there. We're talking, you know, the best of the best, five, ten thousand dollars knives, the works. Um, but the tactical area and um, another one that's very approachable, in my opinion, is a uh, non-knife tool um, for a lot of us custom makers. You know, I make something like called a uh, pry thing or even the NPE, I think, is something I might submit uh, as a non-knife tool in a future judgment. Yeah, that uh, well, actually, don't don't uh, glaze over it. Let's see that uh, that pry thing you just held up. So oh. this, uh, just in doing a, a a brief bit of research on you, this was your entree into knife making. Tell us about that. Oh yeah, well before I ever made my first knife, um, which was probably seven or eight years ago now, I made uh, pry bars and mainly pry bars, bottle openers, pretty much anything I could think of: steel, copper, brass, you name it. Um, I was just looking for a way to, I don't know, I wanted to make knives, but didn't really know how. And I only had like cheap Harbor Freight stuff. So I was just pretty much making anything. Um, and at the time, Instagram loved people making stuff, you know, and there wasn't all these content restrictions there are now. So like I had 5,000 followers on my account before I ever made my first knife. Instagram loved stuff like that at the time. Um, people really ate it up. It was well before algorithms and all that where it just showed you everything in the order people posted it. It was very easy at the time. So that really yeah. aided me a lot in, you know, solidifying what I'm doing now. So you were making knife adjacent items, uh, kind of, uh, uh, so obviously you had, were you an EDC nerd or were you always a knife guy? Like I, how did it, how did it come to the point where you, you just like had to start making knives instead of pry things? All right. So, Oh, well, that's kind of complicated. I wanted to make well, knives well before I ever made pry things. I just didn't have the know-how, the chops, the tooling. Um, so I just started kind of grinding on things, figuring out how to do little bevels, this and that. And and I'd say within three months, I got anxious and just dove in. I built a brake drum forge, um, got some 1080, you know, I, he I heated my uh, steel with charcoal and tested it with a magnet, dipped it in some oil. You know, I just had to do it. Yeah, I'm sure most guys started out the same way. Yeah. And throughout most of history. And, uh, you know, we know from the Rambo movies, he did it that way, too. But they didn't have all these like highly calibrated, um, you know, uh, it, all this highly calibrated equipment. And yet uh, they made it they made it work. And I think that's uh, I, I think you're right. A lot of people do start off that way. And I think it gives you a real knowledge of the materials you're working with. Absolutely. And, you know, there's no uh, disrespect to the guys who buy a $15,000 shop before they make their first knife. That's cool too. If you can do that. I mean, hell, if I could have done that, I probably would have. Yeah. Um, but you know, starting with anything is better than not starting at all. Agreed. Agreed. And, and, uh, just making, you know, getting yourself familiar with the, the sculptural part of making a knife. Um, you know, like you said, learning bevels I've noodled around and, and none of it is easy. Um, so, um, I want to, so I learned from looking at your, uh, at your background and, and now I remember in speaking with you, um, you have a rich history in the restaurant industry and the culinary arts. Um, what, what did you like, tell me about that. I worked in some restaurants and I've had some adventures, uh, in, in that world. Um, how did that prepare you for this? Oh, uh, you know what? It didn't at all. Um, I don't feel like anything I ever do in my past ever prepares me for what I'm actually doing now. You know, it's just uh, maybe makes me a little bit smarter, um, a little bit less likely to make the worst choice. You know, uh, culinary definitely solidified my love for knives. And I have been working with a knife in hand since I was 13, you know, moving up from being a dishwasher to a prep guy in a little diner. Um from there, you know, restaurant to restaurant, moving up the, the food chain, doing my time in the front of house, back of house. Um, a year or two after I graduated high school, decided it was time for culinary school, moved to Chicago, um, 
you know, at the time being in the culinary field, a place like Chicago is the place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm glad I wasn't in that field in Chicago mm-hmm. while COVID happened or anything like that. It would have been uh, rough to say the least. I know a lot of folks who went through that and it was painful to watch. Thankfully, you know, I was uh, making knives and nobody lost an interest in those. Yeah, uh, much to the contrary. I think there was a bit of a knife boom uh, during COVID because there were a lot of people uh, with maybe a little extra income and not spending as much money out there sitting around doom scrolling knives on the internet, you know, never done that oh, before. <laughs> and, you know, I, I won't lie. You maybe a year after, you know, everything kind of died down. People went back to life. Um, I made some excellent tool scores on Craigslist from guys who gave up whatever hobbies they picked up, oh. new drill presses, you name it, all sorts of great stuff popped up. Yeah, it was really like the end of the world. People were like, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's good to always um, plan to stretch yourself. Uh, but but sometimes, you know, you, you got to stick within your nature. And you know, I think I'm going to be a handy guy now. And I'm just going to get a whole bunch of tools. I'm going to start making furniture. It's like, yeah, well, that, you know, that sounds cool. But, uh, well, hey, man, uh, it's it's good to try something new. And it's good to try something hard. And it's good for you because your knife business uh, was able to pick up a little bit of extra tooling for cheap and, and uh, you know, move up a little bit. Um, so, uh, the, uh, working in kitchens, did you have, uh, when you said you've been working with a knife in your hand since 13, were you bringing knives, uh, with you, um, at a certain level, like maybe when you're a chef level, do you start bringing your own knives with you or were you using the stuff that the kitchens provided? I, I carried a knife roll, um, for sure. You know, I really, uh, a lot of my professional cooking work wasn't um, necessarily extravagant, but more high volume. Um, so a lot of what I did, you know, I worked with a seven inch chef knife from a company called Mac for years. I still have it. It's got a huge warp in it now from probably carrying it around my backpack while I rode a bike to work everywhere in Chicago. Um, it had seen better days, but I cannot bring myself to get rid of it at all. Well, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, you, there's no reason to, it's got history. It's got a life in it. I mean, that's, uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's what all used knives. I mean, that's why I have a, a, a whole giant room full. And that's a very small room full of a giant collection of old knives. Uh, I, cause I think they do really retain some of the experience, uh, of the work that they do and some of the, you know, experience of the person who holds them. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Little- Maybe, maybe that's a little corny. Uh, not at all. You know, uh, I feel the same way, you know, that's why I have so many old knives. I have all my knives and tools from culinary school and especially the knives I used while at my professional cooking career. Cause, uh, I worked at some really interesting places, did some really weird and interesting things. You know, uh, a lot of the stories that I would have to tell, which could probably fill up multiple of these segments, um, wouldn't even be available to, you know, 90% of the cooks out there. I just happened to fall into such unique opportunities while cooking in Chicago that some really truly incredible things happened from, you know, meeting my favorite bands to hanging out with all sorts of celebrities uh, to being able to yell at guys like uh flavor town, man, I forget his name. The, oh, the guy uh, with the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, uh, the guy Fieri. Yeah, yeah. So he was in the restaurant that I was working in. He has this thing that he does where he draws a little picture of himself in every place he goes to. Uh, While I was managing at the time during the filming, I caught him and got to scold him. Not that it really mattered. There was graffiti all over the bathrooms anyways, but fun little story I have to take away from it. (laughs) That's awesome. I hope you rang his neck. No, I'm just kidding. I love love the guy. (laughs) He's a little too big for my hands, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I was talking with someone recently about expensive kitchen knives. Now you were, you were talking about um, when we were talking about judging, you mentioned how uh, the, the kitchen knives that you saw that were going up for judgment were just these insane. And we've all seen them um, absolutely beautiful works of, um, you know, working art um, that no one uses. 
Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you think, or, or it's just like when, when the boss comes over for, for the annual dinner that you're throwing and you want to impress, like, I can't imagine when you would use a $10,000 kitchen knife. I mean, I probably would never, and I probably will never in my life, um, to be honest, you know, I can't see myself making a $10,000 kitchen knife, but maybe things shift and things change. Who knows? You know, I'm not much of a forge guy. And that's obviously what that market demands is hand forged. Right. 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 Um, you know, integral and all sorts of crazy Damascus. And, you know, that that's not my world. I don't even pretend to know anything about it. Um, right. But I got to imagine there are certainly, you know, people buy Ferraris and dry them. Why would you not use your $10,000 kitchen knife if you can afford it? Yeah, you know, you raise an interesting point. It's just so outside of my realm of possibility that <laughs> that I can't imagine. It would be hanging on the wall, you know, behind thick glass. Uh, right. Look at my kitchen knife that I never used. Well, so so is the kitchen work, okay, there must have been a time where uh, you had to, decide to take the plunge because this is your full-time job there must have been a time a scary time when you're like uh restaurant or knife making and everyone thinks i'm crazy for doing knife making you know uh i was already doing it as a hobby um working 80 plus hours a week as the general manager of a restaurant bar Oof. oh that's my website <laughs> um and uh, a family member of mine fell ill, they had cancer, um, doing great now, beat it, all right good, uh, but needed some help. So I was doing, you know, a lot of back and forth from Detroit to uh, Chicago. And I just, I couldn't work 80 hours a week and do that at the same time. So I continued my hobby, which I was already making a little bit of money off of, um, and took more time to help my family. And once they cleared up, I, the business was doing better. Um, I saw the opportunity to take it from a hobby to the next level. And granted, it was very difficult. Uh, no way I would have been able to do it without the help of my amazing wife who worked ass off to help me, you know, pay the bills and do everything else just to make it happen. And it's you know, finally at a point now where I'm so comfortable that, you know, thinking about walking away from this doesn't really feel like a viable option. Oh, that's that's amazing. Um, I, I love uh, the family stories. Um, you know, you and your wife, um, you know, making, making it work together. I think that's, uh, awesome. I love hearing those kind of stories. How does it, how does it work working with your wife? Well, you know, she has her own full-time job, which gets mm -hmm. us insurance, which is very important, obviously in this field, mm -hmm. uh, with me, you know, she's kind of like inventory management, make sure I stay on top of things, make sure, you know, stuff's paid by the date it needs to be paid. And of course, like the most important factors show back up. Um, she really keeps me on my toes more than anything. I, she's more of an operations manager as her role. Well, I mean, uh, really, I was digging and that's exactly what I thought it was going to be because uh, women are uh, tend to be, I don't mean to paint with a broad brush, but detail oriented, you know, well, at least way more than I am uh, where I work. And certainly my wife is way more, you know, uh, together we make a powerful force because uh every every duo needs a dreamer and a and a doer and then also a doer and a organizer <laughs> you know right uh so uh, do you think that having that relationship uh in the business makes it a a stronger business than you would if you had just gone out and gotten uh, some you know random folks to work for you oh absolutely you know, I've managed people in restaurants for so many years and I decided when I left that I do not want to manage people again. It's just, it's not satisfying to me. You know, it's someone's always going to let you down 100 percent mm -hmm. of the time. It always happens one way or the other. Um, you know, if my wife, I'm usually the one letting people down. That's fine. She accepts me for who I am and loves me still. Um, but our dynamic, you know, with her strengths and my strengths and especially my weaknesses and her strengths um really help get things done and you know we talk about a future where maybe she could be full-time with the business and it could be that way you know, i see a lot of other makers do it scorpion six and i'm sure there's plenty of others that are you know husband wife teams um we you know it's really expensive out here in the west i don't feel like this is the right place where we could do it mm -hmm. um, but we are planning on you know a move at some point in time just to justify doing that specifically you know, uh, my shop is crazy expensive where we live is expensive, you know, and 
I see places in, you know, bum F nowhere where it's like a shop and a building and 10 acres for like 120,000. And I'm like, what yeah. the hell am I doing here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, so we talk about like, well, maybe for five years, we'll just live somewhere we don't really want to live and just like build, 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 and not really worry about luxuries and how we're living and this and that, you know, obviously yeah. we won't live in squalor, but yeah. we all make sacrifices to want to see our businesses grow. Yeah. And so um, what if there's a mountain lion problem, you know, uh, yeah. you, you build a little, a little hallway to the, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But to me, that's I grew a up in Detroit, you know, I've dealt with worse. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, that's a fantasy of mine though. Moving out uh, to the country for sure. I was born in Detroit. I was born in Dearborn. Um, nice. Yeah. So um, I've, I've been back there a few times and my, my family lived there before I was, uh, you know, before I grew up. So I, I've always felt an affinity for uh, Detroit. Would you ever move back to Detroit? Oh, not Detroit. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, you know, from Detroit to Chicago, that was enough city for me. We're in Reno. It's smaller now, but we live away on the outskirts and my right. shop is on the other outskirts. Uh, my next move is going to be like where I cannot see my neighbors. Okay. Got you. All right. All right. Now uh, let me, let me, let's talk about your knives. So um, the, the, let's start with um, the Carl, the Carl, oh. first of all, great name. Um, I, I'm not, well, we can talk about the name in a second, but I love this knife and it's, uh, it's got that, that triangular blade and that handle with the thumb, with the beautiful bird's beak for the thumb. I mean, that's how I, I see that knife. Tell, tell me about this knife, the inspiration for it and, and, you know, how you see this fitting right, into so someone's EDC. I designed this knife very early on in my knife making career in Chicago. I had just gotten into my very first shop there. Um, and a Chicago police officer met me at one of my events, but reached out to me later on. Uh, and he said, Hey, I have these uh, designs I want to see brought to life. So he brought me these three cardboard templates, uh, all kind of like this, but all a little bit different. So I kind of melded them together into my current style at the time, which you know, became this knife. Um, I wasn't even the first few, I wasn't even doing the texture yet. This is, you know, came up maybe a year later, um, designed it up for him. And funny enough, so the name of the knife is the Carl. And uh, at the time, uh, I don't know, maybe he didn't want to give his real name, but he introduced himself as Carl Hungus. Um, some of you may get that reference. Some of you may not. Uh, but I loved it so much when I found a real name and got the reference and it all clicked that I had to name the knife, the Carl. Um, and going on seven years strong now made probably about 300 or so over the years. One of my best sellers to military law enforcement by far. What's Carl Hungus? I don't, I don't know. the. Uh, uh, Carl Hungus is a reference to a porn star in the big Lebowski. Oh. It was very obscure. And I didn't even realize it. And then he said it and it clicked. And I was like, Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And then I found out that Carl's not even the guy's name. I didn't find that out until afterward. Well, so this this got uh, best tactical knife. Um, but I'm I'm betting most people are going to use this for for EDC and just for regular everyday use. Uh, whether you, you know whether no matter what they do. So it's it's uh to me I I love uh, tactical knives and I love like fighting knives and that whole um you know, that's just my favorite uh, genre. Um, I think that this design is cool because it, it goes back and forth. You look at it and at once it looks very utilitarian, but it also looks just very businessy that especially the bird's beak in that extreme triangular blade shape, it looks like, uh, you know, uh, a weapon. So I, I love the combination of, you know, the utility and the weapon nature of this. Uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly is. And, you know, a lot of people, I, I'm sure, you know, a lot of guys tell me that it goes on their kit or their plate carrier or what have you, uh, whatever cool term uh, there is for it. Um, but I know a lot of guys, you know, uh, I mean, granted, I have one and there's stuff on it, but I know a lot of people just buy the knife and carry it as is, you know, on their take the sheath, put it in waistband. It's, it carries really yeah. easy. And um, even better, I have the Carl Jr., coming out in just a few weeks, which is pretty exciting, takes this down to a much more manageable seven inches overall. 
Um, it's going to be a really nice EDC carry, especially paired up with an offensive industries in pocket sheath. Um, these are going to be nice. really nice. I'm very excited to get these out. This, um, this, so I, I, I carry in the waistband here. Um, and I love the, the discrete carry concepts clip. And actually, uh, the, the, so, uh, here is a dedicated pocket sheath that I just happen to have on the, on the table. This is the Amtac Northman, but the, the, this is interesting. Uh, it's inflexible though. Cause if, if I wanted to carry this in the waistband, I could, but, uh, with this clip, it's sunk so far down in my waistband that it would cut the belt on the way out or the, the seam, whereas in the pocket, it's loose enough. It can, it can handle. I, I, so I love the in-pocket option for fixed blade carry. And when I look at your Carl, can you hold it up again, please? One of, one of my, yeah. One of my uh, things I look for in a, in a daily carry fixed blade is a rounded uh, handle and somewhat short, but a rounded handle that will not um, interfere with my with my shrinking, but albeit still there, love handles and my ribs when I sit down in the car and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, and to me, the Carl looks kind of optimized for the kind of carry I, I do. Uh, it's so, yeah. And, you know, it, it's so thin. Like, I don't know if you can really tell, you know, the oh, steel's wow. an eighth inch. I don't think it's going to focus on this. I'll do one of these YouTube things because everybody loves it. You know, uh, it's a really thin overall carry. And the biggest downfall to being EDC, what everybody told me is that it's just a little too big. You know, it's a great full size knife and a great kit knife. But mm -hmm. if you want to carry it every single day or maybe tuck your shirt in or have some other options, it's just a little too big. Um, and I think the Carl Jr. is really going to fill that void. And to follow up with you, what you said about the in-pocket versus on-belt, um, I just can't quite master making the in-pockets myself. That's why I get them from Offensive Industries. And the way I do it mm. is when you get one from me, you add on the Offensive Industries in-pocket sheets. So you always do receive uh, your two sheets, uh, with the exception of the Variant 3 knife that does only come with the Offensive Industries. Longer story there. Offensive Industries, I, I I think I know their sheaths. They, they do a lot. They do a sort of somewhat famous ambidextrous model for Picol style knives, right? Like, um, uh, is that right? Am I thinking of the right? Uh... Uh, that's correct. I mean, he does it for all styles of knives at this point. Okay. You know, they definitely started with a certain kind of genre, but he's all over the place now. He'll, he does sheaths for his own knives, which he's recently started making. Um, does a lot of stuff for my knives. Hmm. Um, and I know he's doing stuff for a few other companies as well, Wegner and uh, MF Blades and a few other guys too. But he's definitely moving his focus on to knife making. So I'm lucky to have gotten with him while I did. Uh, and he really does. His focus though on his sheets is solely for in-pocket deep concealment carry. And so for the Carl, you know, the sheath he has maybe this much of the knife actually sticks out of your pocket enough to just hook on and draw. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, man, carrying a knife this big in your front pocket, you know, I wear 5'11 and cool yeah. pants and all sorts of whatever stuff. And all the pockets are big enough to accommodate or big enough to accommodate that. It, it is a game changing way to carry a fixed blade, in my opinion. You know, a knife this big, safely and readily held in your pocket is such a nice thing to have. Yeah, no doubt. And and it's not concealed because it does peek out above the pocket and um, so, uh, I know a lot of people might have legal, uh, issues, uh, with, with concealing, uh, you know, I don't get into scrapes with officers often, uh, enough Never. for it to be an issue with me. Uh, but, uh, but I, I do like the idea that that is an option. Um, you know, if you need to show it, uh, so will the Carl, do you have a Carl jr. Uh, close by? Or uh, I, well, unfortunately, I do not. I'm super picked over right now and <laughs> spending all you. of my time getting ready for Blade Show Texas, um, which I feel like I'm kind of behind for. So like, even if you went on my website right now, which I saw you guys kind of on there for a second, um, yeah. compared to how I normally keep myself stocked, it's pretty limited at the moment. Okay, so um, oh, actually, before I move on to other knives, because I want I, I want to find out about some of the other knives, especially uh, the the Sume. Well, I like a lot. I like them all. The Bottle Rocket. I want to talk about all of them. But uh, with the Carl Jr., I'm interested in in this because hmm, I really like uh, the Carl, and maybe this is a, a self interested. Uh, 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 maybe this question is out of self interest. But if you could show the Carl 
and and then show me kind of how much smaller the Carl Jr. would be. Sure. All right, so we have the Carl here, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna take about an inch off the blade, mm -hmm. narrow it down just a hair, thin the entire handle out just slightly, make this divot here a little bit deeper, and knock this down to about there, rounded out nicely. Um, it's going to be a really, really nice carry option. But what I'll tell you is uh, just have me on again and I'll show it to you next time. Oh, beautiful. Uh, it's a deal, man. You don't have to ask <laughs> me twice. Um, okay. So uh, the one that I remember um, really uh, resonating with me was the bottle rocket. I love daggers. I do not have a daily carry dagger, um, which is, uh, which seems strange. I mean, I do have a, a lot of double edged curvy things and that kind of thing but i i have no perfect little dagger and the bottle rocket really um uh, jumped out at me uh can you show that off and tell us about it so i can show you something in the bottle rocket family okay. unfortunately i'm completely sold out of my standard bottle rockets um that's what i was grinding today actually uh, oh, cool. but i do have a bottle rocket xl with me Oh, in Serape yeah. Micarta. Now, the thing about the Serape Micarta is it does make it kind of difficult to see the facets on the handle. But I think you can get a pretty good feeling for it. And, you know, in my opinion, what I've been told a lot, uh, as people finally hold these knives after they see them on the internet or on YouTube or wherever, is that, oh, you know, I looked like a really big blocky handle. But no matter which direction you hold this knife, it fits perfectly into the hand. And I mean, any direction it locks right in. Um, and it's, you know, I, I kind of spent a lot of time really trying to get this planned out um, for how these facets work. And, you know, it's, um, I'm probably going to butcher this name and someone's going to tear me up in the comments. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of a skidoo shape, you know, and this is sign yeah. dub is how it's spelled, but I think it's skidoo. Am I right? Ish? I, I I I don't know. I say ski and do, uh, but ski and do. Perfect. I've heard that it a million different ways. Say. It's like so the sock knife. Like some influence from that shape you can kind of see on the handle there. Yeah. Um, and then the facets, rather than rounding it, really just kind of give it its shape. Um, that it's really, the whole Rocket series has really become known for the handle. And I keep building on it and adding new things, single edge versions and, you know, uh, reverse grinds and just everything you can think of. Um, I plan on continue adding to it. You know, this has definitely become the staple lineup um, in what I'm offering right now. Uh, you're you're talking about the facets on the handle and, and showing them off. And I appreciate what you said, like... Uh, that the faceting is there instead of the rounding and, and really that uh, I, everyone likes contouring and rounding that feels good. But when it's faceted like that, it really locks into your hand in a different way where there's, it, there's no twisting at all. You know, sometimes um, I, I was going down memory lane with the old um, hollow handled, uh, you know, fake Rambo knives I used to have when I was yeah. a kid and how, you know, you would wind up and whack at a tree and it would it would twist in your hand because it was like a perfectly cylindrical handle. And um, uh, the the faceting and, and you know, in, in cross section, that handle is octagonal. And that really gives you a, a really good lock in, you know. Oh, it does. And then on top of that, you know, every knife gets uh, a full bead blasts and that you know even adds a little bit of additional micro texture and it really that little bit of additional surface area adds so much more grip when you're talking wet muddy bloody mm -hmm. environments so what oh that's cool that, that's nice uh <laughs> so uh sorry uh, if you're listening uh jim is scrolling through uh the auxiliary manufacturing website and yeah uh, or uh, the instagram page and i'm I'm falling. I'm falling for some of these, for all of these models. I love this little runt. Uh, before we talk oh, about yeah. the runt, tell me about your, your process here. Um, how are you making these? Um, I, I see daggers. I see a lot of them and man, they seem like a, a real bear to grind. What's your process? Uh, you know, not much different than anybody else's, uh, water jet cut my stuff. Now, you know, once I started doing the daggers, water jet, was mandatory. You, just, you can't fight with this symmetry nonstop. You know, it's uh, so pretty much everything I do now is water jet with the exception of the kitchen stuff, but that's easy to cut out. 
Um, from there, you know, I do all my heat treatment in house uh, and my even heat kiln, super easy, wrap it up, throw it in there, do a couple cycles a day. I can heat treat depending on the knives between 10, 10 to 20 knives a day. Uh, uh, from there, you know, temper, cryo, all in shop as well. Move on to bevel grinding. I do have a little runt here also, mm, um, which you can't cool. really see the bevel on this, but it's a nice, almost full flat. Um, all the work done in shop, you know, move on to bevel grinding, do my swedges. Um, some, like I mentioned, I bead blast everything. So I don't worry about the blade finish pre-handle. Uh, because I okay. use all composite materials and everything I do is stable. So it can all be blasted and blackened and go through all the processes just fine. I um, so glue it up. Knife's still real ugly at this point. It's not blasted or anything. You know, got my grinder striations and probably some heat treat oxidation on the flats. Uh, get it glued up with its handle, whatever it may be. Serape, G10. Uh, once it's glued up, I get it shaped, you know, whether it's faceting. This guy's simple flat slab scales. Uh, glue it up, shape it up move on. I just got a beautiful new blast cabinet set up. So like that's mm -hmm. the easiest and best part of my job. Give it a good blast. Uh, pretty much everything I do nowadays is stainless. So it gets a uh, stainless blackening compound, a quick tumble, and we're pretty much done besides an edge. What, uh, what kind of stainless do you use these days? Uh, I use mostly AEBL, um, oh, okay. some nitro V here and there. And I just, now I have a big shipment of blanks coming in, in Magna Cut. So you can oh, expect cool. to see some full-size curls and bottle rockets in Magna Cup first, followed by pretty much everything else. Right on. Uh, yeah, uh, I know if I've skimmed over that, people would 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 uh, want to know what steals. Uh, but I want to get back to the the making of the dagger in particular. So after after you have it all uh, water jetted out, you're still fighting the symmetry, as you put it, when you're beveling those four bevels, right? Yeah, and so. Also, when I started making daggers, and I'll, I make well over probably 100 daggers a month at this point. It's a lot of daggers. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a lot of my lineup and a lot of my inventory are all daggers. And once I really started moving to daggers, did water jet, that's when I also kind of, I used to be hardcore, you know, freehand grinder die. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, I would shout it from the rooftops three years ago. Um, man, I jig all the daggers now. This is a business. I got a life outside of it. I am not going to keep throwing away money, wasting steel. You know, nobody wants this knife with the, you know, sorry, the bevels all the way to the center collapsing on each other. It's just, it wasn't worth it. So I gave up, you know, all the daggers now are jigged. It just, if you're a starting out knife maker and you're worried about anybody caring, whether you freehand grind your knives, 99% of end users don't care. Maybe another knife maker did. Who cares what they think? Do you yeah. make the best tool you possibly can with every tool at your disposal? Use a jig, uh, water jet stuff, you know, be a smart business person and make your money work for you. Pay for the things that other people can do for you. You know, you want to make stainless knives and don't have a kiln, have somebody else heat treat them, figure it out. But you know, uh, there's no sense in tech. Lost my train of thought slightly there as well. Getting them on a well, little range. I mean, there's there's always someone more pure than the most pure. You know, well, I oh, do everything course. freehand, and well, then there's someone who does everything freehand. You know, with a with with one hand tied behind their back, you know, whatever it is. Uh, there's always someone who's a little bit more pure. So uh, that's a silly fight to get into. And I I always uh, you know I I went to art school and and uh, and then I started doing filmmaking and. And I got some pushback from my fine art friends who were like, what? You know, and I'm like, you, you know, like, yeah, the camera was invented like several hundred years ago at this point, guys. Uh, I think we can adopt it. A and B, you know, if Rembrandt were alive, he would be taking advantage of all these tools. That's what great artists do. And in this case, that's what great knife makers do. You know, <clears throat> you if you're going to try and make a business out of it, that is, uh, you might be a hobbyist. You might have a a career in a totally different line of work and and really savor the making of knives and you know and and not care about your your output but if that's your bread and butter you have to figure out ways to be efficient in any way you can absolutely 100 percent. i mean and that goes for anything whatever you can do to streamline your process uh 
don't worry about how anybody else is going to interpret that. Just do what works best for you because those people probably weren't meant to be customers of yours anyways, if that's what you're worrying about. Um, you know, uh, I spent a long time worrying about what other makers thought on Instagram and this and that. And I didn't really come into my own of who I am, what I make, my style, which I feel like now is more pronounced than ever until I stopped. And I hope I can say this, uh, giving a shit uh, about what anybody else thinks. You know, there's you're never going to please anybody all the time. So just make people who like what you do as happy as possible. Yeah, that's that's actually a very freeing thing that uh, often uh, comes with age, I think. Uh, But but in this case, it's earned through, you know, work. And and also when you're working through something new and you're kind of earning your bones, you discover a lot along the way about, you know, uh, why you're really in it and what you want to express with it. It's not you know, going into knife making is not like, ah, I'm going to get my real estate license. You know, it's not a practical move. Um, it, it is, it is the opposite. And, and it's a real, you know, p- sort of passion play and, and it's sad when it fails. So if you, if you fail through lack of, uh, you know, creativity and process, uh, that, that would just, that would be terrible. And if you failed because you were trying to make knives that aren't your knives, because, you give a crap about what someone says, uh, then you've also kind of failed. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, I hate to use this as an example because it's such a legendary guy, but, you know, we look at Loveless Knives and there are a thousand different guys that probably have an in-progress Loveless template knife in their shop right now. And more power to you. If that's what you do, you better do it really good, though. You know, in my opinion, it's much easier to find your own style and carve your own way than to try to live up to any other standards that were set before you or by anybody else. Yeah. Those loveless designs like the sub hilt, the, the, the black bear classic or whatever it's called the big sub hilt fighter. Uh, and, and then the shoot knife and, and his hunter and then the city knife, New York knife or whatever they call it. To me, those are like jazz standards. Those are like, Things that every bass player has got to learn how to play. Every jazz band has to know uh, Autumn in New York or whatever it is. Um, well, same thing with certain uh, a certain sector of knife makers. You know, the, yeah. the guys who produce the classics, you know, they and, and I think that that is cool. Keeping that it's like the Great American Songbook, the Great American Knife Book, keeping those designs alive, I think is really cool. Um, and that's a, a, a kind of a different area of discipline in a way. Oh, absolutely. And I'm by no means bashing what these guys do. Right. In my opinion, though, I'm just stating it's 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 much harder to break into that market and be successful in it. Your oh competition is so, yeah. so stiff. Uh, and I mean, like you're, you know, I'm making t- tactical knives, you know, sure, there's lots of guys doing it. But in my opinion, except for like, you know, guys like Bob T and a few others, none of the best knife makers in the world are really making tactical knives. They're making Bowies and Loveless Designs and, you know, other stuff that high-end collectors want. Yeah, and and to your point, uh, when you're making those kind of knives and you're that kind of knife maker, you're being compared to all of the greats, including the original great. Uh, Whereas, you know, with your knives, they are your knives, (laughs) you know, so they're being judged against your knives from last year. And that's the best part is I just keep getting better. So like my knives from last year are nowhere near as good as the ones I do now. Just, uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's good. Progress is great. Yeah, it is. It is great because, uh, you know, no doubt the old ones are, are, are good too. Uh, but, but so there's a definite divide, not divide, but you have a, a range, let's say, and and kitchen and then and then really you know pretty tactical i i love tactical knives you know you've got daggers you've got the the push dagger which i'd love the, actually that's probably going to be my my entree because i've been looking for a push dagger that appeals to me for a while i have an old cold steel but i want something uh, so that the the carl the sume uh, which is your little picol knife it looks like a scalpel Love um, it. One, of, one of my most popular designs now, they uh, just go like crazy. You know, um, 
And they're so inexpensive, you know, the base model's 125 and with Stingray at 150 currently, oh, sweet. Um, it's hard to not want to get one, you know, like I still buy knives from other makers myself. And when I see something that's cool and small and affordable, I can't help but just jump on it. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. Those, your kitchen knives are, are beautiful. But before we talk about the kitchen knives, I want to get, I want to talk about this tactical thing. What, and then you have the non-permissive environment knife, you know, so if you have to, yeah. yeah. So uh, where does your love of, or interest in, or, 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 you know, why are you compelled to make this kind of knife? You know, what's so weird. I'm like a heavy metal guy. I don't know if you can tell. I got the beard and like I wear black and stuff. I love metal. I worked at a heavy metal bar for a long time. It's, I honestly, like my uh, intention was never necessarily to make tactical knives. Um, I just wanted to make cool black knives and they just so happened to come out purpose driven in a way, you know, like, and now it's just kind of ingrained in what I do. Cause I, like I said, I have my style much more defined. So it's very easy to come up with new designs or to alter things to meet my new styles better. Mm -hmm. Um, but I by no means went into this initially thinking I was going to make tactical knives. Um, not even close, you know, uh, really the first ever custom knife I held was a red, one of the, it's gotta be one of the first like 20 ever red horse knives. Oh. Um, cause he's in Chicago too. While I was in Chicago, I, I know Ed, um, we, as far as I know, both Ed and I knew each other before either of us made our first knife because my boss at one time was his good friend. Um, big black. What's up, Frank, if you're watching either way, saw that knife really made me like, Oh, I can make cool knives for people to carry. I still didn't have a style or anything yet. You know, my first bunch of knives were pocket cleavers. I love pocket cleavers. It felt like a good transition from the kitchen to carry kind of silly nowadays when I think about it, but we all have weird transitions. What can I say? You know, our teenage years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, now I'm very clearly defined in what I do. It's very easy to recognize something of mine from somebody else's, even though they're, you know, I'm flattered to say there are now people copying things that I do. It's pretty cool, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess that means you've arrived when people start, um, uh, imitating you. It's, I, I can imagine it's a little annoying. Uh, I, you know what, but with your knives, actually, now that, now that we're sitting here, looking at them talking do you have a sume near you or you're sold out the little pickal uh you know i do not have one unfortunately I, I think i might have one in my backpack but unfortunately i don't have it here with me i can scramble to find it it's all good it's uh, been up on um, screen and we can we can show it again but um really my point is uh now i'm now i'm 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 splitting hairs but the term tactical to me is too military for your knives i i see your knives as daily carry self defense um but mostly utility. You're mostly carrying it. You're mostly pulling it out for that errant, uh, you know, thread on your collar to cut your sandwich and your apple and open that Amazon box full of other knives and this kind of thing. Um, and then, That's on the, right there. yeah, 100% is utility is all I really go for, you know, like, um, and tactical in my opinion is a well overused term because in the moment, anything you have with you is tactical. You know, yeah, yeah, if yeah. I'm like out walking and I have like a, I, you name it, whatever, some big silly thing in my hand. I just bought at Home Depot. Like that's tactical. Now it's an assault yeah. rate, whatever, you know, like um, <laughs> utility is the, the perfect term, in my opinion, to describe what I make. You know, it's uh, knives to be used. You know, I told you I was never going to make a $10,000 chef knife. Like I make things with the intention uh, of them being used. Um, and I do so with finishes on them that are easy for me to redo. So when you send your knife in for a spa and a sharpen, you get it back and it looks exactly the same way. Right. Jim is, is showing some of your older builds. And I think it's interesting because you can Very see, stuff right there. You, you can see the experimentation going on. You can see the sort of uh, uh, germinating handle styles that, that are prominent in your kitchen knives these days. You know, the, the multi-material handles, uh, these are all beautiful and they're all different. And, and, that's another part of uh, that. That's another way I can tell this is these are older works because you can just see you're kind of feeling out, learning your design language. And then um, uh, so tell me about the so I'm each one of these I'm looking at the handles. Uh, there's a, a lot of attention paid to them. 
Um, yeah. Tell me about the evolution of your kitchen knives, which which all have a very, very particular uh, blade. They all look like the same model, but they all look like they're handled very individually and they're beautiful. Tell me about making kitchen knives and, and how that differs uh, from the other stuff you do. Oh, man. Making kitchen knives is a whole other ball game. Honestly, it's a pain. Like there's uh, upsides and downsides to both. In my opinion, making kitchen knives uh, in some senses is easier. You know, like my kitchen knives, I delete the plunges on them. So it's just one flat thing. They kind of showed a few of them, but you know, on like a tactical knife, you have a very defined bevel. Um, that is not a concern on my kitchen knives. You know, the concern on my kitchen knives is does it have a nice distal taper? Um, is the edge thin enough? Is the edge thickness consistent throughout? Um, the concerns, in my opinion, from one knife to the other, while it should be, you know, to, you know, paid to both, uh, the overall concerns are kind of different though. You know, the things that I really focus on, on my kitchen knives might not be the number one priority on a carry knife, you know, having a very consistent, edge thickness uh, isn't going to be the end of the world on a knife like this or on a kitchen knife. You want to have one very consistent, smooth edge to make cutting as smooth as possible. So do you think with your years and years of experience working professionally in kitchens that you're harder on yourself with your kitchen knives or, or is it, is it a different relationship to the, to the, to the making, you know, are you, you looking for for other things because you've used that kind of knife in particular for so long you know kitchen knives are also the only things that i still make that are one of a kind um all my other stuff you know mm -hmm. there's probably one of a kind ones you know uh, a bottle rocket with you know this one handle that i only did one time or something but the kitchen knives are the true one of a kind knives that i still make we're talking multi-segmented handles intricate liner work varying materials you know those are really uh, the only thing I still do that way, you know, all my other stuff, all the Carl's, you know, I've made hundreds of these um, mm -hmm. in the same exact configuration, AEBL, G10, textured, bead blasted, blackened, tumbled. Um, you know, for me personally, the kitchen knives and, uh, you know, the fact that I don't get them water jet, it's my one last true artistic expression that I allow myself to have. Oh, um, you know, if I went solely hardcore business, I would probably phase that out. Cause let's be realistic, you know, uh, 95% of my market isn't buying those kitchen knives. They might not even buy kitchen knives. They may just accumulate them. You know, uh, mm. the guys I know that have, you know, two gun safes full and a huge knife collection probably have one kitchen knife and it yeah. probably isn't great. let's be realistic here. You right. Know? right. Right. I I've only recently been, uh, I only recently got my first custom kitchen knife and now I'm like, what have I been doing all this time? So now that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole other uh, sector of my, of my uh, knife collection that I, I have to fill out. Um, with the, with the, with the kitchen knives, do you take them custom, uh, custom orders only, or do you kind of make some and present them and then. You know, I, I still take custom orders on them, but typically they're just making whatever I feel like okay. I'm kind of, toning down my custom orders, only doing, you know, about five or so a month. So I can really focus on growth in other areas. Um, in my experience, you know, making one-off stuff is really cool and it's very exciting. And in my opinion, it makes your Instagram look a lot cooler because there's different stuff constantly and it's much more entertaining, but you know, in the time it takes me to make a single one of a kind knife, I can make three Carl's or three, you know, something else, you know, if everything's the same, just is what it is, same process, same steps. It's much easier to move through that. So how, how has uh, the, you mentioned Instagram a number of times, how has the knife world, the knife community um, embraced you or, or how, how has your interaction with the community been as you have, uh, you know, taken the reins and started this business? Uh, nothing but positive. I mean, obviously, you know, there's sour pusses among the mix people that might be unhappy that, you know, I got an award or unhappy that I did this or did that or whatever, you know, but you'll find that everywhere. I'm sure, you know, you'll get hateful YouTube comp comments on your videos from time to time of, you know, people whose opinion you probably shouldn't care about. Yeah, um, yeah. But Instagram, you know, without Instagram and when I started my Instagram specifically, I'm a firm believer that that was very important. Uh, in my success without Instagram, I'm sure I would not be doing this, at least at the volume I am today, much less full time, you know, um, 
And I think that probably goes for a lot of other guys that probably started making, you know, five to eight years ago and kind of grew your business and your following on Instagram, which I know tons of us did. Um, probably most of the knife makers that I would consider good friends now, I know because of Instagram and that's how we met and how we originally connected. And there are still guys that I would consider true friends that I would go well out of my way to help that I've never met in person, but know through Instagram and phone calls and this and that and doing blade shows. Now I'm meeting them and it's really cool to meet them over the years, but there are still guys that I've known for years and years that I might not ever meet, but they're still great friends because of Instagram. Nice. All right. So um, I, I got to know, what is the knife that you would want to build? Like, what's your ultimate build? What do you want to make before you hang up your cleats in years and years and years? I'm glad I made this knife. What is it? Oh, a, a, a frame lock. But I want to do it this year. I don't want to oh. wait years and years. I've, I've been trying to build this thing forever. I'm terrible at math. I don't know shit about machines. I'm a guy... I, who just mashes metal into a grinder. So like making a folder has been difficult. I have a box full of garbage prototypes, material that I've wasted over the years. I'm going to get it this year though. Guarantee it. Well, don't, no, take that back. No guarantees. <laughs> I want to try real hard though. Well, what's cool is, uh, you know, actually linking it back to my question about uh, the knife community. Um, there is no shortage of, you know, generosity out there. Um, really, you can ask so many people, you know, I, I've heard this so many times from so many people I have learned through asking other people and they tell me their secrets and they know like Bob Terzuola could tell you all of his secrets. You're never going to make one of his knives. You know, uh, yeah. those secrets just might help you, though, get over the hump that you're needing to get over. So um, you will and it will happen this year. I guarantee it. Whew. All kidding. right, man. Well, if I don't, it's on you and you, you got to You got to live up to it. No. Okay. Um, so where do you see uh, auxiliary manufacturing, which by the way, is a cool name. That's Thank a, you. that's a good name for a, for, but where do you see auxiliary manufacturing, you know, at its pinnacle, what do you want to see the company become? You know what? I just would like to be my wife and I living on a big piece of property, nice shop, doing our things, doing the shows and just, uh, living our lives without uh, anybody else telling us what we need to do or where we need to be. You know, that's, that's why I really love doing this. Um, you know, I love knives, but people ask me all the time if I'm like passionate and I'm like, it's a job still calm down. Okay. Um, I'm passionate about fishing and my hobbies and things that are fun. And maybe if I wasn't doing this to literally make my living, it would be a lot more fun. Um, that being said, the reason that I never want to stop doing this is because I don't want to have a boss again. Being this independent is truly the best gift I've ever given myself. You know, as long as I have enough money to pay my bills, I don't feel like working, I'll go fishing because it's a nice day out and I live five minutes from the river. Or you know what, I get to the shop and it's really hot that day and it sucks. Well, I'll drive by the, up to the top of the mountain that's right by there, Peavine Peak, and I'll eat my lunch up there and look down at the shop in the nice cool breeze. Uh, it's just cool to be able to, have ultimate freedom to spend my time as I want it because time, you know, is the only thing none of us can get more of. Oof. Couldn't have said it better. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming on the knife junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. And uh, I've enjoyed talking well with you and also checking out your knives and talking about where, where they all come from. Um, it's been a pleasure. I mean, I look forward to shaking your hand again at blade show Atlanta for sure. This Not year, Texas. Uh, I won't be going to Texas no, unfortunately. Okay, can I plug Texas? Guys, come see me. Yeah. Table 12E, Blade Show, Texas. It's going to be a great time. Got some really cool stuff. Blade Show, Texas, 12E. Thank you so much, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Hey, I had a great time, Bob. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. 
There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jarvis of Auxiliary Manufacturing. Uh, go to his Instagram or his website. Well, definitely follow him on Instagram. Uh, but check out the broadhead, his push dagger, and let me know what you think because uh, it, it's a chisel ground little masterpiece. And um, boy, he's got a couple of cool uh, um, handles, uh, some uh, antique micarta handles on them. So I just might be entering a push dagger phase. We'll have to see. Uh, please join us again next week for another great interview and Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, don't forget Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.